independent, fearless and credible journalism. We start with residents of Nuka, a small community in the eastern region. They say they are grateful to the winner of the second edition of the John News Impact Makers Award for spearheading efforts to establish the first basic school in the area. The winner, Eunice Asidua Ejapon, has already started receiving calls from NGOs and philanthropists who want to support the Noka community. She was posted to the non-existent school. But instead of changing her posting, she collaborated with the community authorities to start the first basic school in that area. Max Walagwagwa followed her to the school after she won the award and filed this report. Finally here. Ladies and gentlemen, with a standing ovation, the woman of the moment, Miss Eunice Asiedu Ejipon. This Ladies was the moment Eunice Asiedu Ejipon was declared winner of the second edition of the Joy News Impact Makers Awards. Scores of pupils have gathered in front of their classrooms singing to welcome their teacher, 26-year-old Eunice Esiedua Ejipon, back to school. It has been 72 hours since she was crowned the winner of the 2024 Impact Makers Awards. And the excitement on the children's faces is unmistakable. Four years ago, Eunice arrived in this community to find a non-existent school. Rather than seeking a transfer, she stayed collaborating with a local pastor and traditional leaders to transform a church into a makeshift school. Starting with just seven pupils in that church building, the school's enrollment has soared to 125 pupils in six months and now boasts nine trained teachers. In fact, as the Bible has stated that uh, we should try... Here at the Noka MA Basic School, I've met Reverend Prince Obusin Tiamwa, founder of the Maranatha Power Ministries International, who generously offered his church to begin this educational journey. He credits Eunice as a pivotal force in this endeavor and expresses his gratitude to join Eunice for recognizing her efforts. She has done great work for her. He, she, she's the one who started the school. She, she came to me that they, they, they want to start a new school here, so how can I help her? So I'm the one who registered the, the children. And after she has come, then I, I, give, I give the names and then the little, little amount that we will be receiving to her. Secretary to the Nuka Town Development Committee, James Yaokwachi shares his appreciation for the blessings that Joy News and Eunice in Japan have brought to their community. Eunice has been a great help to, 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 to this school. When we, we, we started, he was the, she was the only teacher here. She mobilized the children before the Ministry of Education sent some, some teachers here. So she has been very, very helpful to, to, to this school. Joy New has been a blessing, I would say, to, to the whole nation. They have been helping us in diverse ways. So what I would say is that they should continue to during their great work. Classes are in full swing with Eunice diligently teaching the pupils. Under Miss Japan's leadership, the Nuka MA Basic School offers education from kindergarten to basic sis. Eunice says she has started receiving calls from NGOs and philanthropists eager to support the community right after she won the Joy News Impact Makers Award. It's also I feel excited after the awards and coming back to work with the kids, their smiles. At least I, I, feel, I feel overwhelmed that at least what I was doing in the dark, it has come to light. And looking at the smiles on the kids, I am so excited, super, super excited. The future is bright. 
the future is bright. And I know we, we have a lot of big men and women in them. So with them schooling, I'm hoping to see uh, in the next future big uh, doctors, engineers, teachers, and probably president, ministers and peace in them. Now let's do some politics now. The National Council of the Governing New Patriotic Party will on Thursday, 4th of July, decide the fate of Dr. Matthew Broku Pempe, Energy Minister, as running mate of flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. Well, this follows the completion of the necessary consultation by Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, which saw the acceptance of Dr. Matthew Broku Pempe by President Kufado. But we know that on Friday, June 28th, the majority leader, Alexander Afeo Markin, confirmed that the caucus is in full support of Dr. Balmier's choice of Napo as running mate. But is this confirmed? Now, let's engage the director of communication for Dr. Balmier's campaign team, Dennis Murakawaje. Thank you for your time here Thank you on for me. News Decks. Now, this has taken quite some time. We have less than five months to the election. Your opposition the biggest opposition party has already outdoored their mm. running mate. Why do you think this has kept so long? Will this affect your chances? Actually, it hasn't. Mm. I mean, if you follow the MPP, you realize that we are very well within our timelines. Mm. Um, the last time we had a scenario like this, that's the nomination of Dr. Mahmoud Bami as a running mate. Mm -hmm. that, was in, that was in August. Yeah. August 2008. And so really, if we are successful at the timelines we've set for ourselves now, which is likely to be on Thursday, then we are way ahead of our own schedule. There are internal <coughs> wranglings about the choice of Napo as running mate. Is he fit to bring the people together to canvas the votes needed? I think um, comparatively, I haven't seen so much of internal wranglings. Mm. Um, you, you are very much aware that there are a lot more persons within the party that are very well qualified to be running mates to Dr. Mahmoud Bami. And um, so a couple of people were looking forward to being their nominees for, for, for the running mate rule. So you should expect that one or two persons may be disappointed and their followers or loved ones would also be disappointed. But that's the beauty of democracy. The, the essence of it is that once we are done and settled on one person, we, we all rally behind the person. And you can trust the MPP that right after Thursday when the National Council meets and ratifies or approves the recommendation from Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. Everybody is going to rally behind, behind Dr. Bamiya and Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe. Uh, we have the view that this is a perfect pair, a perfect pair for Mother Ghana going into the future. And everyone within the party is committed to that cause. And yeah, Pierre Kubi <coughs> feels otherwise. He feels Napo is not a unifier. He feels Napo would not submit to authority. In your internal checks, is that the case? I have seen and heard a lot more members of parliament share contrary views. Mm. I heard the majority leader. I heard the member of parliament for Ifijaku Abrenot. I heard the member of parliament for Ansawum. I heard the member of parliament. I have heard several members of parliament um, eulogize Dr. Dr. Matthew Poko Pempe and speak of how uh, much of a go-getter he is, how much of a disciplinarian he is, how resource-oriented he is, and how much of a team player he has been. You know, he's been in parliament for one, a long time. He's mm. one of the longest serving members of parliament. And he served on several committees in, in parliament. And I think that his, his leadership qualities in the public sector is one that is obvious for everybody to see and will not be subjected to an individual's um, um, opinion. Uh, the, the view that the majority have of him is, is one that is quite refreshing and, and positive for the party and, and government. It's one thing for the party to accept him. It's another thing for Ghanaians to accept him. Do you think he's the right candidate if you're looking at getting votes from the rural place of Ghana? Especially when, during the energy crisis, he was asked to brief the media on steps forward, give us a load shed in timetable. He felt it wasn't necessary. Ghanaians felt that was rude. Do you think he's the right person? So, so Dr. Mahmoud Bamir's um, indicators for selecting a running mate were predominantly two, mm -hmm. main, two main ones. One that is bringing a huge political capital, and then the other, one that, the other one that would be this person who will complement his efforts in implementing the vision that he has for the country. And clearly, Dr. Matteo Poku Pempe brings out these two important elements. Um, he's an astute politician, very experienced, one of the most experienced politicians we have actually in, in this country as we speak. 
um, one of the longest serving members of parliament. He's run elections and be a candidate for several years. He's come, coming from a strongest hold. He's liked and loved by the Ashanti region based on the um, kind of social impact he's had in, in the region and, and, and near and far. For the general population, they are looking for one that would solve problems. They are not looking for one that would necessarily lie on the floor or enroll on the floor. They are looking for that individual that would listen, hear them out, engage them, and solve their problems. Remember when Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe was Minister for Education? Mm -hmm. If you compare his time at the Ministry of Education to the time of all the ministers preceding him, you'd realize that it was during his time that we had so much stability in the education sector, little labor upheavals, simply because the labor unions and the leadership and the labor union members will tell you that that Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe will call you into his office, sit down with you, jaw jaw and engage you so that we arrive at a solution. In this country, you barely have the kind of experience that we had during the time of Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe at the education ministry. It's either NAGRAT or NAT or CCT or some you know, uh, unrest somewhere. But the entire period Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe was, I was at that ministry, you'd, you'd realize that he was able to calm things down, stabilize the sector, and that led to his ability to implement one of the most impactful social intervention policies we've seen in this country, which is the free city high school policy. The, the, the impact he made at the ministry, the transformation he brought to the ministry, the reforms he brought to the ministry, the impact it had on the lives of the Ghanaian people within that period is still felt and remembered by, by, by the people. The energy sector, look at the stability there. It's, it's extremely difficult for you to have a sector where you run four years without energy disruptions. Recently when we had just about 10 weeks of energy disruptions, you see the agitations. And that brought the question of you know, timetable. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that, first of all, that was a moment, a, a moment that is interpreted in different ways. The context, the venue, the location, the microphone, the time, and you ask, are you bringing a timetable? He said, there is no doom so. So why are you asking me for a timetable? But at that time, we're feeling the pinch. Yes, but... but at he, that time, there were intermittent power but, but he, But yes, intermittent. Yeah. But you see, there, there was a specific direct question mm -hmm. as to whether, when are you bringing the timetable? We time needed table. a timetable. Exactly. And then he said, he doesn't think that from where we are going into, we need a timetable. That's basically what, and the person insists, they say, okay, then go ahead and prepare your time to over because I am the one in charge. I am fixing the issues. I'm working at it, and I don't think that there's a need for a timetable. But we are Ghanaians. We feel we need it. The posture of the people weeks. was that, talk to us in a way that makes us feel some sort of comfort. I think that the, the, the context, mm. even the ambience and the environment and everything impacted how that was interpreted. This was like a party rally when people were even screaming and people were shouting and you know, then they put the microphone at the pen. I don't think that we should isolate this matter, that particular incident, and interpret it the way that we are doing. I haven't really seen him comment on it, but I think it's quite unfair on him on, on that particular moment because there was a specific conversation. Give us a timetable. The man in charge says, we are fixing it. There's no need for a timetable. I don't think we need a timetable. Oh, yeah, but we need it. I said, okay, go, go and prepare your timetable and break. Three weeks afterwards, he fixes it. Mm -hmm. Three weeks afterwards, he fixes it. So really, I think that it depends on how you look at it. Is it that you're looking at it as a half full glass or a half empty glass? But critically for the people of Ghana is that you ask him for a timetable, he said that there's no need for a timetable because the issues are being fixed, and he delivered. Which one do you think the Ghanaian person will place so much premium on? The delivery and fixing the situation or giving you a timetable to just let you feel good? Well, let's look at his candidature because that is even subject to approval by the National Council. Mm. Now, should the National Council reject him, the party does not have a running mate. Which other name do you think can pop up? I don't think that's likely to happen mm. um, because um, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya did not just get up to, you know, speak to some of the stakeholders that will make this name public. The last time I was here, I remember I mentioned to you that He's always known who his running mate was going to be even before the presidential primaries. Because before he set himself out to run for this contest, he needed to prepare and plot, run a SWOT, make sure that where he has weaknesses and where he has shortfalls, he knows who will complement him. And so over the period, since November 5th, when he became the, run, uh, the flag bearer, 
he has been engaging almost everybody in the room that's going to be there on Thursday for National Council. Mm -hmm. And he solicited for their views. And he engaged and consulted widely before he settled and said, I think this decision is the best for us as a party. So you can be rest assured that on Thursday, almost everybody in that room for the National Council meeting has already engaged or interfaced with Dr. Mahmoud Baumia on the choice of, of Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe. And those hurdles have been cleared. Let's look at the plan. You had the communications team. So should he be approved as the running mate? How do you plan to disabuse the minds of Ghanaians that he comes across as a rude person? There, 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 there is always a fine line between being assertive and confident and being described as arrogant mm. and rude. Is that the case? Mm. It's a fine line. I mean, we've had several politicians who have been described in, 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 similar, in similar manner. Let the Ghanaian people begin to interface and engage him. You don't tell people who you are. You let people feel and experience who you are. The majority of the Ghanaians are only, the, the, they've only heard or seen him from afar. He's going to engage them. Mm. He's going to speak to them. He's going to visit them in their homes. He's going to visit them in their shops. He's going to visit them in their churches and their place of needs. After that engagement, you make your own assertion. At the moment, a lot of your assertions are based on the headlines, are based on the comments by opposition parties. Wait and meet the person. And that's what a lot of Ghanaians believe in. Ghanaians believe that you don't come and tell me who somebody is. Let me experience the person and make my own judgment. He is not going to be adored. Let him be adored. Let him now subject himself to the people of Ghana and engage them. And let the people of Ghana form their own opinion. At the moment, I don't think they've formed the opinion yet. These are views of few individuals who may or may not like the person. But there are over 30 million Ghanaians who need a leader. Allow them to make their own choices and make their own opinion formations. Do you feel Napo would bring unity in the party? Na 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 Napo is already united the party. That is the reason why he is a running mate. Dr. Mahmoud Bam, feels otherwise. Apia Kubi is one. You've had 10 people speak, mm. and you've had one person say otherwise. And why are you picking on that? Why is that representative? Every view matters. 10 people. You cannot have everybody. Joy, in this, your organization, mm. do you agree with everything? Before I got, I came here, when I was being mic'd, your production really had this agreement. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the blue is too much. Somebody said the green is too much. And the one holding the, the remote said, oh, but you said I should do it. It doesn't mean they are fighting. They are still working as a team. Is that the case? Mm. But they disagree on certain things. That doesn't represent the view of everybody. The majority view is what we are running with. The new patriotic party is united behind Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. And not just be, united behind Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe. And not just because he is Napo, but also because as a party person, as a politician, as a member of parliament, his leadership and role and team play in this party is next to none. And all of us are a testament to it. I am very young, way younger than Honorable Apia Kubi. Mm. But the experience I've had... a party member, that's why we're concerned. How do you change the opinion of people inside the party? You, you always have to work to change the views of people. Mm. You cannot rule it out. Is everybody in, in NDC supporting Mahama? Did he get 100% in their contest? So it means that there are people in the NDC who don't like Mahama. Haven't you read the letter Dufour wrote about Mahama? Does it mean that Dufour, after Dufour wrote that letter during their contest, didn't you see him follow him recently when they were going to have the inauguration of the, of the running mates? So you should understand the fact that Dufour, the fact that uh, Yawat Sinjan and Co spoke ill of Mahama and um, Jinnana Mensa means that what? It is a political party. MPP gets millions of votes. You don't expect that everybody would think in sync. But your responsibility is to work on everybody to understand that you may disagree with me, but this is the common cause we all need to pursue. Mm. And that disagreement doesn't become a subject matter. It is unfair to make the minority view the subject matter against the majority view. That's not how you run a democratic uh, institution. The campaign strategy is quite important to me. We know that Mahmoud Ibamiya has been to all the regions, especially the north, with Napo coming into the picture. I know he will focus on the Ashanti region and other close regions. But in swing regions, how do you plan 
to move into those. How places. do you know Napo was a Jeton? Because I, I know that me. I know that. Relax. <laughs> I know Napo is coming from the Ashanti region. You also mentioned. So maybe you will not even keep him there because he comes from there. We'll take him somewhere to go and bring us. So more. tell us what's the so plan. So exactly, you were quite so definite. Tell us, tell us the plan. I, I think that we'll not share our plan on, on TV. Why? Because we have opponents who are watching. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we are going to do, we are going to beat the NDC in this election with a strategy that they will never understand. One that will shock them. One that will, that will amaze them. You remember how, before we came into 2024, they said we don't have a message and we cannot even go out to campaign. I'm sure you remember. Yeah. And then because they were there, they were the only ones. And I'm sure you remember how in about six weeks, Dr. Baumia pushed them into obliv oblivion. And now you can't find them anywhere. And that till dates, the Ghanaian people are struggling to understand what they represent and what the options they are. That's how we are going to beat the NDC. We are superior to the NDC. We have a, a, a flag bearer that is superior to John Mahama. A flag bearer that is more committed and less sincere to the people of Ghana than John Mahama. John Mahama is disrespecting us by even thinking of coming to tell us that we should vote for him. He's disrespecting us. It's an insult to the people of Ghana for us to see him on TV and say, vote against these people and vote for me rather. You collapsed and sold 300 factories. We should vote for the people who have worked the private sector to bring 300 factories. We should vote against them and vote for you. You withdrew teacher and nurses allowance. You are telling us that vote against those who have restored teachers and nurses allowance and give it to me. You kept teachers and nurses who graduated at home, 2014, 15, 16. These people have come to keep them at, at post. You are saying that vote against the MPP even though they brought these teachers and nurses to work and vote for me who kept them at home. Teachers and nurses worked for a year. You pay them for three months. You are saying that the ones that is paying them for the time they are working should be voted out, and then you, who pay them for three months instead of one year, you should be voted for. It doesn't add up. You kept us in darkness for three years out of your four years. You are saying that the guys that kept power on for seven years, eight years in the Athena should be voted out for you. It doesn't add up. You constructed over just about 4,000 kilometers of road. You are saying that we should vote against the government that has constructed 12,000 kilometers of road and vote for you. It doesn't add up. This government has encountered challenges. The macroeconomic indicators are difficult, have been difficult in the past three, four years. But this government is working at it. What we are having, the conversation we are having with the people of Ghana is this. Let's protect the gains we have made. Let's protect the little effort we've been able to, the little output we've been able to make whilst we pursue the outstanding ones. And that's why Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya proposes the bold solutions. The bold solutions encompasses protecting the gains, protecting and consolidating the gains we have made, at the same time proposing specific sector tailor-made solutions to all the issues confronting us in, in, in this country. And the people are receiving it well. It's resonating with the people because they don't trust Mahama. They believe in Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. Mahama was vice president. He came to tell us in 2012 that he's a spare driver. You remember he said that mm. at the IEA debate. He said, I'm a spare driver. Make me the main driver and I will deliver you. Your candidate and then, says he's a mate as well. Exactly. A mate is far productive than the spare driver. Mm. Do you know what the spare drivers do? For those who go to church or ask your cameraman <laughs> in the production room, when you go to the church station, mm -hmm. let me show you the setting. Mm -hmm. At the church station, the critical people, there's a bookman. You know the bookman? Yes. Then there, there are mates and the drivers. You know there's a shed. Yeah. That shed where they play their draft and the ludu. So when, whilst you are loading, you are playing your draft and your ludu. Over there, there are two categories of people. There are the drivers who are driving the cars and the spare drivers. They, they lazy around. They do nothing. The only time you see a spare driver do something is when a driver doesn't show up for work because he's not well. Or a driver has to do something and the spare driver will come and take your car temporarily and go. But do you know what happens to the mate? Mm -hmm. Whilst the driver is relaxing for his structure to be loaded, the mate is loading it. The mate is cleaning the car. The mate is washing the car. The mate is checking the oil. A mate is far productive to the effort of transport than a spare driver. So really take your time to analyze the situation. But that's not just by the, beside the key point. The point here is that he said he's a spare driver. We should make him the main driver. We listened. We actually listened. And we made him a main driver. When he became main driver, what did he do to us? In fact, at the time when we went through challenges, which were domestically induced. I won't say that governments do not encounter challenges. Every government will encounter challenges. But the difference between the good leader and the bad leader is that the good leader is not saying that there will be absence of challenges. But a good leader is the one that, in the presence of challenges and difficulties, is able to mobilize the people, work with them, to get them out on the, on, on the path of prosperity and progress. When he encountered challenges, when we were in energy crisis, 
when doctors were asking for better conditions of service, when nurses, the poor parents were asking for support for their children to go to school, he told the poor people in this country that if you only vote for me on the basis of the restoration of your nurses and teachers allowance, then I'll ask you to vote against me. He told the doctors that he's not ready to negotiate with them on anything. At a time when we didn't have power, he was increasing electricity. When we told him that it's becoming too expensive, even though it's not there, he said if it's becoming too expensive, stop charging your phone. That is that fine difference between John Mahama and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. We have a government that says that, yes, we acknowledge that there are challenges. The economic indicators have, haven't been easy, but we beg you. We have to take some hard pills now to be able to get ourselves out of this once and for all. Mm. Shall we look at these solu solutions? We need to do debt, debt restructuring, please. You need to let go a certain portion of your assets. It is just to save the state. We need to come back on our feet. And this government has been working day and night, day and night slowly to try to get us out of it. You are saying that we should get this government out and bring you. You who encounter, tell me, what was the global economic challenges we encountered in 2013, 14, 15, and 16 that warranted the difficulties we went through? We didn't have power simply because we had generators but had no money to buy fuel to power the generators. The that same was all. challenge we're facing now. No, we are not. The same challenge we faced for 10 weeks. The same challenge we faced for 10 weeks. So that's the same challenge, and you are right. For 10 weeks. Why would you let go a government that put you through that challenge for 10 weeks for a government that put you through for three years? That is why Ghanaians don't trust him. That poor woman that you left her child at home for not accessing senior high school is the one going to vote against you. That senior high school, that basic school dropout, who wanted to go to school so bad, but couldn't go because the parents were poor, and she had to fall for teenage pregnancy, is going to vote against you, and her child will vote against you. That is the reality. And it's very disrespectful and insulting for him to come back to us and come and ask us for our vote. And this is what the NDC does. They do this in every election. President Kufo brought this country out of oblivion. Brought the country up to a certain level in 2008, where Ghana was called the gateway to Africa. In fact, we were said that we were in the golden age of business. Banks used to come to our homes to come and beg us to come and take loans. He brought national health insurance. He brought free maternal care. He made basic education free by bringing capitation and topped it up with giving them free school feeding. Even in spite of all of these things, President Kofo encountered challenges in 2008. You remember the Wall Street economic crunch? In this country, fuel prices went high. At the same time, you couldn't even get the fuel to buy. You had to queue at filling stations for two days before you get one gallon to buy. Water was a scarcity in this, in this city. There was shortage of water, and that brought the famous Kofor Gallon. People in Laboni Cantonment will walk with Kofor Gallon, the yellow gallons, looking for water. Do you know what the NDC did? When they realized that the Ghanaian persons were going through this discomfort between March 2008 and December, they said, let's pick on this, and let's press the emotions of the Ghanaian persons. So Ghana, forget about all the, things, the good things Kofor has done. Forget about all the progress Kofor has brought you. They are thieves. That is why you don't have water. They are thieves. That's why you don't, fuel is so expensive. Go to the Bank of Ghana. They've stolen all the gold from the bank reserve. There is nothing there. These are their bank statements. ADB, NIB. See, they are, they are criminals. They are stealing our money. Kofo is promiscuous. He has a, a twin, twin babies with Gizeh Yazi, Paul and Peter. It's been years since Kofo left office. This case has stood on here because they were lies. Complete lies. Eventually, when the general secretary, now general secretary of the NDC, became deputy finance minister and was being vetted and asked, Honorable, you said that Kofo had stolen all the gold from the Bank of Ghana Reserve. Please, now you are now in government. Have you checked? Do we still have it there? I said, oh, you know, Mr. Chairman, um, I was not the one who said it. Some people said it and I was only published it. So you have that is you how, have, you that have is how, no, that government. is how, mm. that is how tricky the NDC can be. And that is the reason why the people of Ghana are today telling John Mahama that we've seen this before. Mm. We've heard this before. We understand there are difficulties. We understand there are challenges. But we are paying attention to the gains that have been made. For the first time in the history of this country, we want to protect these gains. Mm. So we want a leader that believes in the gains we've made so that we see how he can help us achieve the others that are outstanding. You have become vice president. You have become president. You've done all it is that you could. Shall we give another Ghanaian the chance? And that new Ghanaian is, is Dr. Mahmoud Bami. Let's come back to the key policies you're running with. Eight years back, the key policies the party was running with. 
key among them, the free SHS policy, as well as to lift the economy. The city depreciation, you promised us that you would stop that from happening. Now, we're looking at the economic indicators as we speak. And it's not all that you had promised us. The city is it's depreciating as we speak. The economic indicators are not as favorable as we had hoped it would be. We're currently in the IMF when you promised us that you wouldn't take us to the IMF. So what's the campaign message this time? So every, every time in the life of a country, there are different challenges. Mm -hmm. The challenges that was there in 2008 were different from the challenges in 2012. And the 2012 challenges were different from 2016. And 2016 different from 2020, likewise now. Now, don't pretend as if those are the only things we spoke about. We told the people of Ghana that we are going to elevate the health sector, especially the emergency services we have delivered. We told the people of Ghana that we are going to ensure that we give everybody access to quality education, especially at the secondary school level, we have delivered. We told the people of Ghana that we are going to construct their roads and make sure that we create access to move their goods up and down. We have delivered. We told the people of Ghana that we are going to ensure that we enhance the railway sector, we have delivered. We told the people of Ghana that we are going to partner with private sector to set up factories across districts in this country, we have delivered. 321 of them, 160 of them are operational, others are ongoing. So there are several things that it is that we've, we said we'll do that we've been able to do. Between 2017 and 2020, the things we promised the people of Ghana in 2016, largely we achieved. Have you seen the economic indicators between 2019 and 2020? Fantastic. We moved inflation from 15% 2016 to a single digit 8%. So don't pretend as if what we said in 2016, we didn't do it. We did. Then we encountered a challenge. A challenge that is not entirely dependent on Ghana. And I'll ask you a simple question. I'm not the host, but answer me in sincerity. Unfortunately, I won't answer this question. Is it true? No, you don't know the question. So <laughs> I just, won't even answer no, the just, question. Is it true mm -hmm. that the world encountered a global pandemic in 2020? We is it true? Is it true? In, no, but this is a simple yes or no. Why are you being invasive? No, no, is it true? We know it's a yes or no. no I can't Why are you being yes invasive? No Why not? Answer. Is it true? I, I haven't said anything else. I'm asking you a simple question. No. Did we encounter a pandemic? We did. Also, COVID 19. Is it true that UK in 2022, within six months, between March and November, changed their prime ministers twice or three times because of economic difficulties? Is it true that the United States has seen an all-time 40-year inflation like never before? Three days ago or four days ago, when there was a debate between Donald Trump and Biden, when they were on stage, you heard Biden say, listen, price of goods are high because of COVID and Russia-Ukraine war. Is Russia and Ukraine in America? Was COVID in America alone? But they felt it. Nigeria is in turmoil. They are struggling. They felt it. Every single country, somewhere in 2022, 2023, Turkey, where we import a lot of things. In fact, these chairs that we are sitting on are likely coming from Turkey. Turkey had 80% inflation. So the fact is that so it's between okay, we are 20, the part, who has said that? The, part, the, the fact is that between 2020 and now, all countries have been busy trying to recover from a global economic disruption, and Ghana hasn't been an exception. The difference between this government and governments in the past is that because we acknowledge these difficulties, government has found ways to ensure that we try to meet up the Ghanaian at certain times, not all times. Go and check how much a teacher was being paid in 2016 and check how much a teacher is being paid now. You realize that inflation might have gone high, but see the, high, the, the, the rate of increase in their, in their income. Go and see how much a typical fresh doctor was earning first year in 2016. So if I go and check how much. Right. So the point is that mm -hmm. there are difficulties, there are challenges, but we have a government that is committed to work with the people to get us out of the challenges and difficulties. It means that you should knock the government out and go and bring an abysmal, incompetent government simply because you've encountered one or two challenges. How about the ones that he has done? So if I get you right, all the problems we're facing as a country is as a result of COVID-19. Who has said that? Inclu including Why are you using illegal all? mining. Why are you using all? Including Why are you using mining. all? Why are you putting words in my mind? You don't want to answer questions. Including but I want to put it. Have you heard me say all? Okay. No, admit. Well, explain Have I said me. all? Explain so ask me. me another question, but don't say all. You didn't hear me right. Okay. Because I never said so all. Give us so clarity. raise another issue. Give us clarity. No, but I haven't said all. So I don't know what you are talking about. So, raise so give us issue. clarity on what. Right now, mm. you said that COVID is the reason why, why COVID is the reason why our macroeconomic indicators went haywire. That is fact. Mm -hmm. 
Russia-Ukraine war is one of the reasons why our macroeconomic indicators went way wire. That is fact. And let me explain to you. We import a lot of things from Asia and Turkey and Brazil, Vietnam, including Russia and Ukraine. When COVID came, Asia shut down. Europe shut down. Those who were even producing were producing at 50%. So let me show you how, how it impacted us. When you go to go and buy the things you bring to Ghana, the thing that you used to buy at $10, you go to China and they tell you that, well, we are not producing much, so we don't have much now. It is now $20. What it means is that you used to bring this thing to Ghana at $10 to sell at $12. You can no longer do that because you are going to buy it at $20. So when you bring it to Ghana, you have to sell it $20 plus your profit. That is impact. That is inflation. Do you agree? You said I should explain to you. Make your point. No, but do you agree? But Make your point. No, do you, why don't you want to respond to that one? I because it is fact. It. Number two, honest. Russia and Ukraine war is not in Ghana. But you see, we buy rice from Vietnam. We buy rice from Brazil. Brazil and Vietnam buy most of their nitrates that they use for fertilizer to plant the rice that we go and buy from Russia. And because of the international bans and all of that in Russia, they are not getting it at either exorbitant prices or they are not getting it at all. So it's raising the cost of buying rice from Vietnam and Brazil. So ladies and gentlemen, the bomb is not in Ghana, but any economist that is being objective will tell you that that is how it impacts on us. Turkey experienced 80% inflation somewhere in 2022. What it means is that this chair that we go and buy from Turkey at let's say $100 will no longer be $100 by what? $180 because it's grown by 80%. So when you bring it to Ghana, you can no longer sell this chair at $120 like you used to sell it. You must sell it at $200. So you see, we have only imported the inflation from Turkey. That is why this government said that, listen, we need to build our industrial base. And that is why if you're going to look at the industrial base scorecard between the MPP and the NDC, we are ahead of them. They did just about five. We have done 321. In fact, let me put it on record, and you like facts, so I'll give you facts. The NDC is asking us, to vote against the government that has worked with private sector to bring 300 factories up. And vote for them. Who sold 300 of our factories? 300 of Ghanaian-owned factories. Not Ghanaian-owned factories, state factories. Do you know that Gassem belonged to the people of Ghana? It used to be a state-owned factory. Do you know that we used to assemble VW vehicles in Ghana? Do you know that we used to produce glass and there was a Boston glass factory in Ghana? Are you aware that we even import a lot of matches? And yes, we used to have Cadet Match Company in Ghana. Between 1988 and 1993, their ancestors, PNDC, sold 60 of state-owned factories. Now, between 1993 and 2001, their descendants, the NDC, sold over 300 of state-owned factories to themselves. They are cronies like tomatoes, like chupa chops. I'm glad so wait, so wait, so wait. So now you are asking us to vote for the, to vote against the government mm. that is working to build factories and has come up with close to 300 factories. Vote against them and vote for you. Who sold not just private ones that are collapsing, but even state ones. Indeed, they even went on to seize privately owned factories. Mm. Watch a mattress and cool. They collapsed them. Go to Makola, go to Okaishi. People's grandmothers were lashed on the street. Their shops were seized and their goods were seized. That is the party that is asking us to vote against the one that is building industries and vote for them to come to office. I'll take you back a bit because I'll go. you made mention of state capture and selling of state-owned properties. Mm. Not all MP Samuel Kujeto Ablako has been raising concerns about Senate sale of four hotels, 60% stake in these four hotels, to Brian Echampong, who is the Greek minister, member of the NPP. When should your party come into power? Would you address these issues? Which issue? Of, of continuous sale of state property to which, which states, which, who are aligned to the party? It is extremely hypocritical. In mm. fact, I, I don't pay attention to that conversation simply because the last person to speak about state capture is the NDC, let alone Okujuta Ablakwa. What is his business? What is his moral right? The guys who sold 300 of our factories are saying that all of a sudden they love Ghana more than everybody. Is that what they are saying? All of a sudden, they love Ghana more than everybody. They sold 300. They sold to themselves. Ghana Film Company, today's TV3, they sold it and went to buy it. Now they own it. They sold it, sold it to a third party, went behind and went to buy it. Now they own it. Okujita Blackwa should go and take TV3 back for us first before he says anything else. Finally, as we wrap up on the show, what's your message to Ghanaians as we await the 
official announcement of Dr. Matthew Pokupempe as the running mate to Dr. Baumia? Just as the um, flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has been telling the people, mm. two things. We must protect what we have achieved. It's not everything. There is so much left to be done. But let's protect what we have achieved. And let's pay critical attention to the propositions he's making for every sector. He's mentioned the Minerals Development Bank, which is an idea that he believes would support the small-scale miners to own the concessions rather than the current situation where the land is ours, and yet we have just 5% interest for the Ghanaian person, and the rest is foreign. What is the foreigners bringing? Money. So let's give them the, them the Minerals Development Bank to back them so they can own it, mine the minerals, wholly Ghanaian owned, then we can buy in cities and use it to back our currency to strengthen it. That is one of Dr. Mahmoud Bamiye's way of going into the future, building the strength of our currency. And you know Ghana, 90% of our economic cost is the currency. Once we fix the currency situation, a lot of the issues will be dealt with. So that's a major, major, major proposition, the Mineral Development Bank that he wants to use. Whilst at it, he believes that we must continue to build the industrial base. Don't forget there's a deep hole. We had 300. By now, if the 300 were there, would have had 621 based on what we've done. But we have to now go and fill the hole the NDC created. They sold the factories and turned them into churches and what have, warehouses and what have you. So we still need to finish that industrial building so that it will reduce our dependence on imports. But whilst at it, we need to still find a way to loosen up the stress on the importers and on our people. So he says he's bringing radical tax reforms, which will ensure convenience in tax assessment, convenience in tax payment, and also reduction in the taxes. He proposes that we bring our port duties down to the level of at least Togo or even lower than them. So our ports can be more competitive to receive more volumes and increase our revenue. He also, he also proposes a flat rate tax regime for our spare parts dealers. So that at least once they are getting a flat rate, they can plan very well and know how much they need to bring and also increase the volumes that they could also bring. Then they can also have it, let it have a positive impact on, 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 on the buyers. He speaks of the one million youth that he intends to train in software, IT, and other coding uh, uh, programs to open them up to the global job opportunities that are available. Today, you know India exports millions of, of people. There are call centers here in Ghana that are based in India. You are aware of that. You, you call somebody speaking, but the person is in India. You go to the UK, the US, their call centers have been outsourced, and the people are in India. That's what Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya is preaching. Why is he able to do that? He cannot do that because of all the digital base that he has created. That's why I said that every situation and every time are not the same. Today, we have a, dig, a, more, a much more digitized society, which didn't used to be there. And that is the reason why he can move on to introduce some of these things. Today, our children in secondary schools are receiving tablets, something that didn't used to be there. And that is why he can introduce some of these things. Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya says that our friends and brothers who are persons with disability, they should be able to go to tertiary institutions for free. They should go for free. And then don't forget, he's already removed the guarantor system from the um, loan, student loan trust at the university. So you go to basic school for free. He has given you free senior high school. You go to the university if you are poor, you don't worry. You just take your Ghana card. You get a loan to pay your fees and you are in school. Guess what? When you graduate and you come from Sechiri or so or Jine Jine and you get a job opportunity at multimedia, don't worry, don't fret. Don't think how you are going to live and how you are going to move because rent in Accra is expensive. You don't have the money. He says that there is rent assistance scheme for you, the young person. When you graduate, don't bother about necessarily how you survive to be able to come and work at multimedia. Mm. Go to the rent assessment, rent uh, assistance scheme secretariat, get rent support, go and rent your, your new room and be able to come to work at, at multimedia. There's a complete value chain system that Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is, is putting in place for this country. Mm. And every sector, he has a tailor-made solution for where we are at the moment and the next chapter of this country's development. Thank you, Miracles Abwaji. Thank you very Director much for having of me. Communication for Dr. Baumia campaign team. We'll be looking forward to the official outdooring of Dapo. That Absolutely. is if he's approved by the National yes. Council. Yes. Well, we're taking a quick breather here on Newstex. We'll be back with more. Do stay tuned in. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Minister of Communications, Esther Usio Kufu, has highlighted the impact of Ghana's Digital Transformation Centers project, which she says has helped enhance digital inclusion. At least 22,000 Ghanaians, including women entrepreneurs, out of school uh, students, teachers, and 
per, uh, persons with disabilities have since 2020 received basic and intermediate digital skills training. Mrs. Owusu Kufu told a closeout ceremony in Kumasi that the gains made so far are helping bridge the digital gap. Here's more in this report. Ghana, with the support of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, the International Telecommunications Union and Cisco introduced the Digital Transformation Center's project to provide underserved Ghanaians with digital skill training. It was implemented by the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications, GIFEC. About 1,200 students have graduated from 30 coding clubs established in schools, and over 1,500 students, mostly girls, have been trained in Python computer programming across the country. Minister of Communication, Esla Ousu Ekufo, praised for the sustainability of the gains made from the project. Some notable achievements have also been chalked under this project. 30 active coding clubs have been established in schools across the country. 1,500 school children, mostly girls, have been trained in Scratch and Python computer programming and robotics. 1,271 children have graduated from the coding clubs, with 300 more currently being trained. The foundation has been laid. Let's build upon it. We're confident that the project has significantly enhanced digital inclusion by broadening access to digital skills and technologies, which are crucial for participating in this digital era. We've also narrowed the gender gap significantly by empowering women and girls and enhancing their economic well-being through the provision of these digital skills. The International Telecommunications Union is happy at the impact the program has had on Ghanaians, as it has promised to continuously work with GIFEC in the future. Susan Tercher is Head of Capacity Skills Development at ITU. This event today doesn't mean we will not continue to collaborate in the future. The initiative continues, the support from ITU and partners to, uh, will continue, and we will continue to work with uh, GIFEC as our DTC in Ghana in the future. Meanwhile, the acting administrator at GIFEC, Mrs. Eva Andopoku, has appealed for funding support for GIFEC's program in underserved and unserved areas. In spite of all our achievements over the years, the inadequacy of funds remains a major challenge to our deployment. Today, I appeal to stakeholders within the global ICT community to join us in addressing this critical need. Your support will enable us to expand our reach and empower more individuals from diverse communities. GIFEC says its quest to provide underserved communities with telephone connectivity is on course. For Joy Business Report, I'm Interior reporting. Now, a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Joshua uh, Abo, is asking the government to focus on investing in the extractive sector to push for economic stability. He said multilateral development banks can also collaborate with national development banks to complement the government's effort in ensuring development across all sectors of the economy. He was speaking at the 2024 Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences public lecture. We need to improve their fiscal position through enhanced domestic resource mobilization to finance increased public investment in climate related areas without increasing government work, which tends to crowd out the private, the private sector. This will require increasing tax revenue through the position of appropriate carbon taxes, improving fiscal position and the use of public funds can help crowd in private investment through public-private partnerships. Ensure efficient management of natural resources to support sustainable growth. Non-renewable natural resources are wasting assets with finite funds. Therefore, revenue generated from their exploitation must be invested to drive inclusive growth and sustainable development. There's a need for African countries to take a look at their investment and stability agreements around these resources 
in ways that promote financial development and inclusive growth. And I would say that I mean, the extractive se sectors, uh, extractive sector is not properly integrated with the rest of the economy. I mean, this operates as silos. So we benefit from such sectors through the export revenue. And if the export revenue will not come to uh, support the financial market, then we are not really benefiting from these resources. And these resources are wasted. They will, they will finish at some point. That's it for the segment. The news continues after the break. Well, thanks for staying with us. Government this week will present the Free Senior High School Bill 2024 to cabinet, to cabinet for a debate. Now, the proposed bill by the Ministry of Education will give legal backing to government's most revered policy, the Free SHS policy. Now, as part of this bill, the Education Ministry is seeking to fade out junior high school from basic school and make it part of secondary school, thereby creating six years of education for secondary school level. Now, this has been met with mixed reactions, and we'll tell you more about it when we come your way at 12 p.m. with Joe News today. My name is Faustina Safo. Thanks for making time to join us. For more news, please log on to myjoanline.com. Have a pleasant morning.